Hello. This presentation is about introducing you to legal writing practices, um, which I think will be useful for developing social work writing practices and understanding the fact that uh, what we're actually dealing with is the world of narrative and narrative um, should never be reduced to pure fact. There are always narratives that are up for grabs, in other words, um, to be tested um, and indeed, in fact, to be identified, whether that be in case writing and good case note writing, uh, giving evidence uh, to panels, to case conferences or indeed in court. Um, and identifying the narratives that are used about the people that we work with, such as the delinquent child or the dangerous bad mother. So in fact, actually, this is an example where interdisciplinarity, um, interprofessionalism can be used to enhance and improve our uh, social work practices. So uh, let's jump into it. So I'm going to cover um, some general points in legal writing, um, including uh, the presentation. Remember we talked about good advocacy was about uh, persuasive persuasiveness. It's an adversarial system, particularly within the common law system. Um, and indeed, even within um, quasi legal bodies such as children's hearings, even though they're not so much adversarial, there's definitely persuasion going on about which, uh, which, which facts, which um, narrative about the issues, they shape and form problem solving, what the issues are, what the risk factors might be, what the opportunities and interventions might be. And also, um, there's also legal writing within legislation. So we'll have a look at some of the kind of issues around memo structure, paragraph structure. Um, I mean, this is really about good writing, uh, looking at the audience. Uh, we don't usually, unless it's a personal diary, write for, for nobody. There's always an audience in mind and you need to consider that when you're, when you're looking at um, the different forms of writing, the kind of analogies and distinctions and I guess um, strategies of revising. So sometimes people can get swept away with legalese, um, there's definitely a plain English movement and the plain English movement suggests that we need to keep things simple. Uh, we need to keep things simple um, and uncluttered. Um, that can be a challenge given that human experiences and circumstances and specific events often are complicated. Um, events don't happen in a very linear way. Uh, there's lots of emotion, there's lots of contradiction, there's c competing viewpoints, but keeping it simple to separate um, the core forms of evidence or facts from the situation you're dealing with. One thing I believe that legal training and legal thinking can help uh, illuminate social work practices, the importance of being precise, uh, the how how, what, when, where, why, uh, to be concise, uh, always to back up your arguments with, um, with evidence that goes to the facts and to front load your conclusions. In other words, to have a link between the, the theories and, and what you want, the themes, your argument with the facts. There has to be kind of synergies in that area. So the issues and the facts uh, what you deem to be the important issues in the situation that you're dealing with in your social work practice need to be backed up um, by the facts to justify your conclusions. And um, at the end of the day, that's what defensible decision making is about. So let's have a look at these. Keep it clear and simple. So sometimes we have this view that legal writing is supposed to be complicated. Well, that's, that's not correct. Um, yes, there is an inherited tradition of long high, highfalutin phrases, probably arcane language with a bit of Latin thrown in. I think increasingly we are, you know, moving to a situation where that approach has been dispensed with. So one of the things I've discovered sometimes when students put in their assessment is they suddenly start adding words that they wouldn't normally 
use in normal essays or indeed in conversation. Things like the word said, as in the said vehicle. We don't talk about the said vehicle, it's like the vehicle. Here and after, here to for, aforesaid, furthermore. So we just kind of need to uh, drop those unless they're absolutely necessary and actually enhance uh, the discussion that you have having. Normally you can find some uh, simpler uh, kind of um, more expansive terms. Okay. The other area that is the use of compound verbs. I'm going to try and keep the kind of introduction to English grammar in this presentation to a minimum, but words like shall, will and must are really um, critical compound verbs. Um, they mean different things and we're going to have a look at an example with the word shall. Um, you need to kind of um, unpack these. Will, must is more, more directive, more determinative. But questions of grammar do become legal issues. There's a very famous Canadian case where a company um, lost over three million in um, reparations because of the uh, whether a comma was inserted into the legal contractual document, document or whether it's missing. So uh, most law students, uh, when they're looking at legal writing, will actually look at the things like how one single comma the Oxford comma can make a difference between whether a contract is binding or not. So a quote from Meachin and Tullock, I'll just read that out. No other word evokes the distinctive style of legal writing in English as much as the word shall. Often few other words are as inappropriate or imprecise for legal purposes. Remembering that good legal drafting, uh, there's no such thing as an accidental word, but Sometimes with poor legal drafting, instead of um, illuminating a um, legal issue can actually create more confusion. And the problem is, as we'll see in the following PowerPoint, the word shall has multiple meanings. So let's, have, let's take a look at this. Okay, so I've used this example. It's an Australian piece of legislation. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. It's the Land Act of 1933, which actually no longer exists. It's been repealed, but I'm using this as a teachable example. Uh, in this legislation, the word shall appears four times, but you'll notice, uh, and this is really uh, quite a good example, because you'll notice, in fact, that there are quite different um, meanings to that word. So again, you can't always assume that the, 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 the word has, a, a, the same word has the same meaning within legislation. You need to check this, and this comes back down to the art of careful reading. So let's have a look at this. So section one, I'll just read it out. Luckily, these sections are quite short. Uh, this act may be cited as the Land Act 1933. That's fine so far. And shall come into operation on a date to be fixed by proclamation. Okay, so again, it's fairly straightforward. This actually, this kind of writing is quite common in statutes, it tells you when um, uh, the legislation will take effect again a date to be fixed by proclamation. So here the word shall is actually used to describe an event that will happen um, in the future. So shall is, is kind of uh, prospective. It's kind of looking forward in, in, into the future at another point in time. But when we move to section 6 point subsection 1, uh, I'll read this out, it, the meaning changes. The Minister for Lands shall be charged with the administration of this Act and the Department. So again, this is a, <coughs> pardon me, common uh, kind of provision within a statute. It's actually about delegations, it's about delegated power, who, who at the end of the day is responsible for the administration of the statute. In this case, it's the Minister for Lands. Okay, so actually here, it's got nothing to do with the future. Uh, you know, it's it's actually quite matter of fact. It's actually used to say, to state or declare a certain fact that the minister actually shall, um, is, in fact, is could be an interesting word there, is charged with the administration of this act. You might be wondering why they don't use is. Um, don't ask me, possibly that's a multi-definitional term as well. 
Now it gets more complicated. Um, section 33, subsection 3A, sub subsection 2. Okay. Let's have let's read this out. The consent of the governor may be given under subsection three, subsection A, subject to such conditions and limitations as the governor shall deem necessary to ensure that the land is used for the designated purpose and the consent shall be endorsed on the instrument of sublease or mortgage as the case may be. Now we don't need to get into the specifics of, of what this act is about. Obviously it's about land and mortgages and purchases, etc. But what we have within this one section are two different usages of the word shall. Let's go back to the section with the governor. The governor shall deem necessary. So here the governor may, it's not saying is or should, but the governor may do something. Okay, so that's another one. It's quite different from section 6.1, where it's a certain fact, a certain fact's been declared. Here, if there's a discretion, the governor may do something. He or she may deem it necessary to ensure that the land is used, et cetera, et cetera. But then again, within the same sentence, extraordinary, uh, there's a different usage. If the governor does, so if the governor does decide to impose conditions, then those conditions must be recorded on relevant documents. So here we are now have a, a move, firstly a movement from discretion, where the governor can exercise his or her powers in the event that the governor does impose conditions, then those conditions must be recorded on relevant documents. So that's a lot to take in. You might want to go back and review the PowerPoints with that slide and just, just have a look. Because sometimes we read these things very quickly without looking at the differences in usage. So you can actually, one of the biggest mistakes is we can actually read into and have a particular uh, pre-existing unconscious interpretation of how something is to be read, which isn't necessarily the case. So the second area is about precision, and I really can't um, uh, uh, overestimate this. This is absolutely profound, and this is the stuff that I must say I often ping students on because there's a lack of precision in, in writing. And it's it doesn't matter what you're writing for, it's really, and who your audience is, it's very important. Uh, it's no different from accurate citation of other sources, but particularly in law, we need to be really precise. So let's break this up. Which law? So usually uh, the legislation itself in the short title, which is the shortened name of the act or statute, and we'll cover this in a couple of weeks when we look at reading legislation. Uh, it has a title, a short title, and it has the jurisdiction and the year. The jurisdiction is, is it a UK Act? Is it from Australia? Is it from Northern Ireland? Is it from Scotland? Jurisdiction is really important and the year. So anytime you're citing legislation, you need to have those three aspects uh, in, in, the, in the citation. Okay, if you don't do that, that's like missing out a year on a book or, or a publisher or indeed the title. It's just as um, uh, uh, poor in the citation method. So for example, there's two domestic abuse acts in Scotland. Don't ask me why, I think it's really bizarre. I think if you're talking about developing the title of statutes in a way that the public is able to understand them, um, there's a sense of openness there. You, it, from my perspective, it would make sense to call each statute by a different name so that they're clearly distinguished, but this has not happened in this case. So, as I said, two domestic, domestic abuse acts. So use its domestic abuse act, and then it has in brackets Scotland, but the final two aspects, the date are, is, is critical here. One's 2011 and the other one's 2018. So it's really important that you put the date on the end of um, the legislation when you're citing it, because actually uh, these, despite the name, these two 
statutes yes they are about domestic abuse but they actually they actually cover different areas in fact you will find that the 2018 legislation introduced and in fact widens our understanding of um, what domestic abuse is considered to be within Scottish law okay and the other aspect is there are domestic abuse acts um, the UK Parliament uh, passed a, a new piece of legislation very recently it's but it's called the domestic abuse act um, but it covers England and Wales so it's really really important to get it right okay and uh, another mistake sometimes students make is they will just suddenly throw in and it's not even a comparative essay they'll suddenly throw in the domestic a domestic abuse act um, from New Zealand, for example, and I'm kind of wondering why, unless you're using it for a comparative example, that legislation has no purchase within Scotland. Okay, so the other area is where, when you're at the precision, if you're writing about a section of an act that defines and enables something to take place, maybe it's a, a some kind of protection order, um, you need to be telling me where in that you don't just say the legislation the legislation could run to 100 pages you know so again it's like if you're doing a direct quote um, from a book or an article you have to put the page number or indeed the paragraph number if it's an online um, article uh, same with legislation it's really important that you you say which section or subsection um, enables or defines that order you need to refer to them i've just put the paragraph sign there so in some legislation they use paragraphs and you can use that little symbol get to know that symbol learn to love the paragraph symbol and you'd say things like section 12 states okay but then you also need to tell me you need to show me and again readers often they don't have the space or time to go and look up where a particular power remember our ID, I, idea of the rule of law that every action of government or an official has to have a legal foundation so we do need to know where 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 is it where does it say in a particular statute in a particular piece of legislation that it's possible and under what circumstances is it possible to remove a child so you need to say go to the place tell me where the section is um and but and what does that section actually enable me to do okay so this is where my so what test comes in what does the section or subsection say and enable? What powers? Powers to do what? Again, you can briefly quote it. How does it relate to the issue that I'm concerned with? So if, for example, I will be recommending the um, uh, removal of a child, I need to show that I'm very clear about on what basis, on what legal basis can I do that? Where, where, where can we go to that says, okay, this is utterly consistent with um, the powers and the processes to enact a particular action. So the third area is, I guess, to support your arguments. And, and legal writing is very different from other forms of writing. Okay, and this is where I've, I've argued that, in fact, legal writing, whilst it's in a particular forum, some of the, 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 the kind of foundations of legal writing i think can be used to benefit um good social work practice as, as i said whether it be in terms of reports case notes or indeed giving um expert testimony okay so we're going to go through this and just kind of unpack this some of this you'll know some of it we knew but this is just about broadening your minds around the issue so most forms of writing, they have a purpose. We as I said, unless we're doing a dear diary, it's written with an audience in mind and a context. Um, the writings are often designed to entertain or inform um, in a context which the reader trusts the writer. Okay, so um, it's it, there is a dialogue, there's a relationship between the writer and the reader and the authority and expertise of the writer. However, because of this adversarial aspect of law where you're trying to you know um, introduce a narrative you're trying to convince you're trying to persuade legal writing usually assumes some some sort of a skeptical audience who are going to kind of weigh up the different kind of um, 
summaries of issues and the conclusions and the recommendations. Um, and, and because it is an adversarial situation, an audience often is prepared to challenge every argument. Okay, so this is, uh, I think, uh, not something to be scared of. What it does is it means that we then kind of have to wise up and uh, develop our skills in defending and having that defensible decision making about every argument and every recommendation. And this is even true for in-house memos where you're recording what you do, <coughs> pardon me, and uh, what uh, you're yeah, the processes of decision making. So we have an audience that demands precision. And I, as I said, I think this situation could apply to social work. Actually, I'm not even sure if an audience is less skeptical of social work practice. I mean, social workers have been in the media in the last 20 years and increasingly, I think there's often a suspicion about the processes. Has there been a consistent process in um, doing undertaking research? around a particular um, situation? Um, has there been appropriate documentation? And do the recommendations for particular interventions or particular strategies have synergies with, with, the, facts, with the facts of the situation? So our goal then as good practitioners is to support every argument with analysis and with authority that's the legal basis for defensible decision making. And obviously we also need to add the ethical basis because sometimes we're weighing up. We've got the paramount principle of the child's best interest, but we've also got um, other sometimes conflicting issues around human rights norms um, for the other parties as well. So let's have a look at the analysis and authority. So you just can't rush in where angels fear to tread. I think that's the expression. You can't just come up with conclusions and then fit the facts around your conclusions. You need to be able to document every major step of an argument. It must be explained. There must be some synergies, some consistencies. It must be explained and justified. Sometimes in law, we call that the chain of causation. It's about linkages between events, interpretations and actions. And there needs to be um, some continuity that's, that's there. Every argument, so the next thing is authority. Every argument must be supported by legal authority. And go back and have a look at week one, the rule of law lecture, you know, the authority might be legislation, it might be a code of practice, which by the way, Triple SC code of practice is linked in with legislation. If you don't know what that legislation is, you need to go back and have a look. I'm not telling you now. There might be case law. So the authorities that we rely on are primarily on cases, statutes and regulations. Okay. Even when you're in an agency or a statutory authority and they have policies, they might seem somewhat cut off from this kind of bigger authority framework, but you should be able to link it back. If you can't, you should be asking questions. Sometimes there are other less obvious authorities that can be what's known as authoritative writings. And there's some great kind of legal tomes within Scottish laws of jurisprudence who have um, influence thinking about procedural issues and philosophical issues in Scottish law. There are some persuasive cases from other jurisdictions that even though technically don't apply, um, often what happens is good lawyers will say, look, this has got persuasive authority. Or in fact, sometimes what happens now is we move into the area of customary law where there are certain areas that are seen to represent, and I discussed this in week one, international standards of behaviour. You know, things about like the best interests of the child, um, uh, customary laws are uh, opposing um, genocide in all shapes and forms, um, and they can become persuasive as well. In an area where there's 
developing reasoning. Uh, you sometimes the courts themselves um, refer and look at journal articles by by academics. Um, and that's particularly, for example, there might be new kind of forms of intervention and understandings about uh, why people do what they do. For example, the impact of trauma on uh, criminological behaviour. Uh, they're important and these areas are always developing and there's lots of debates and lots of discussion. I think the important thing is these other areas certainly aren't the first resort. You go back to, I guess, the the principal area, which is legislation, codes of practice or case law. Okay. Sometimes what people do when they discover legal writing or the legal world is they suddenly become very um, fanciful and, uh, as I said earlier, use language that they wouldn't normally use, get very flowery. Um, you shouldn't be doing that. It's actually about stripping it back to basics, keeping it boring, being counterintuitive. But what's really exciting about this, and I find that again, is very useful, and this is where the interdisciplinarity comes into it, is there's some great insights into this. So if you're writing a memo, for example, and you think that's fairly straightforward, what this chart does, and you need to have a good look at it and uh, ponder it, it's, uh, the, it's a chart. It's I'm just reading at the bottom here, schema of event structure, types of discourse structures and associated effective reactions to narratives. So what this chart really is about is different ways of writing up and describing events, occurrences, situations. And you might feel that that's fairly straightforward. So, um, and it's also about linking a memo structure, linking a narrative to the kind of effect that you want to have on the reader, right? So again, in terms of rhetoric, we always look at what's called pathos, which, which is looking at what emotions do we want to be captured, right? And it's interesting because with all this defensible decision making, often you think this is kind of a bland objective approach. It should be, but at the end of the day, when we talk about uh, storytelling, narratives, whether it be legal or social work, as I said, they're about persuasion and what persuasion engages with the plane of emotive thinking, capturing emotion. Um, the work that we do, whether it be law and social work, at the end of the day is an ethical enterprise about how things should be and how things maybe haven't come up to the standards which we assume in a um, civilised society um, should be adhered to. So again, let's have a look. Event structure. So this is about chronological order. So the chronology is, is about time, when things happened, okay? So sometimes you'll see an event or the facts of a situation within legal documents, in fact, described as a chronology. This might be unfamiliar language. So you have an event happen, the initiating of the event. I'm looking at the top chart here. Exposition, how it's told, how it's proclaimed, how it's spoken about, what is said, what is not said. Always look at what is not said as well. Any complications, sagas, dramas, uh, the great kind of climax, what happens, you know, before it happens, what's going on, the drama. Obviously, climax is more of a kind of like the dramaturgical aspect and the outcome, what happened. Okay, so this is, you would think this um, is fairly straightforward. I can tell you now, and I referred to this back in a previous lecture about, you know, bystander analysis and the, uh, the, the kind of... Um, travails of memory and people notice and see different things and people's even people's sense of time um, can all give you a number of different presentations and perspectives. So here's a so what this uh, chart then goes on to the different ways of discourse structures. Now don't get thrown by that word discourse. Discourse is different ways that we tell stories and narratives. And actually, in fact, you know, that's really what every case note we write 
every recommendation and report that we make is a story, it's a narrative. It doesn't mean it's made up, it's, it's just showing that this is a construction. We're selecting in facts, we're selecting out facts, we're giving certain kind of components of the situation um, relevance. We're, we're deeming other things less important, less relevant. We might in our story point to conflicts, um, conflicting aspects of facts. So the linear one really is, is, is really looking at the idea of suspense. That's the kind of emotion that it's appealing to. Um, in fact, it's exactly the same as the top one, initiating event, exposition, complication, climax and outcome. I'm not going to spend much here. But here we go in the next one, the reversal type, you'll see the order is different. So depending on how we rearrange these, we can change the emphasis. So if we want to kind of get some curiosity, what's going on here? Why did this happen? Why is it so? What can be done about it? We'll change the order. So we'll actually, in this narrative, we will initially focus on the outcome. The woman slapped her child, injured her child. You know, the father physically abused and engaged in coercive behaviours towards the mother and the child. Outcomes, and this is what happened. They were in fear of their life, etc. Exposition, so you have your outcome, you say what's happened, and then you go and explain it backwards in some ways. You explain what's happened, talk about the complications and the climax, and then you link it back to the initiating event, which might be the cause, why did this happen in the first place? Okay. Then we have another style where really in many ways um, it's not based on an effective emotion, although I'm not actually totally convinced by that, but again where the focus is on the initiating event, very similar, what's, you know, what's, what's kicked it off. Then we go straight to what happened after the kick off, what did this result in, a person injured, a person hospitalised, a person abused, and then we explain the, the bits and pieces, any complications in the climax. So you can see there's different ways. What's really great about this is very different ways of telling the same story or the same event with different points of emphasis. Hope that's clear. Okay, and again, this is just another way, very simple, a bit crude in many ways. Um, but I've tried to keep it fairly non-inflammatory. So we've got these kind of three kind of outcomes. One's a suspense, one's a curiosity, the detective wants to know what's happening. Then there's the legal memo. So again, it's, you'll, you'll notice here is a changing of the orders. So under the suspense one, da-da, butler poisons the wine, ding, ding, ding. We'll go straight into an Agatha Christie kind of thing here. Detective will want to know, Lord H dies, legal memo, memo will be more non-expressive, probably just fairly factual, in inverted commas, butler poisons wine. Okay, so you're breaking up the elements here. Suspense, butler brings wine to Lord H. Ta-da, you see that again, you can see that, make a great movie. Butler brings wine, this is under the curiosity one, Lord H dies. There any uh, real chronology with the legal memo stuff. Butler H drinks wine. This is number three. Da -da, we watch him drink. Dun, 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 dun. And Lord H drinks the wine. Again, looking at kind of elements here with the detective thing breaking it up. What was it? Lord H drank the wine. The wine was uh, brought to Lord H and then Lord H has drunk it. And then again, Butler brings wine. Number four, Lord H dies. Butler poisons wine and Lord H drinks the wine. So it's just, again, these are kind of like scaffoldings, but different points of emphasis depending on what you want to have as the outcome. So usually like when you're writing a memo or report, and in fact your uh, assessment of the EAL case study will follow this. You're actually, you're not writing an essay, you're writing a report. So the problems posed and a short answer, looking at the facts, um, having a discussion of those facts and using what I call the crack method, which I will outline in 
further slides and the conclusion. What do you want to happen? Okay. So let's have a look at this. This is the hardest bit. You know, it's great having a bit of a goss, you know, we all like a bit of a goss, but it, in, it, we have professional responsibility to sort out the gossip, right? And stuff that people will bring in. Um, and people will bring in all sorts of irrelevancies. So we need to separate facts from other things. Relevancies, emotions, and hearsay. This one said this, and I'm pretty sure someone said that. Uh, but also stuff that's got nothing to do with what's going on in the situation. You know, it's really not that relevant um, when you're dealing with a situation of um, sexual abuse about whether the house is red or blue, right? Unless there's some kind of pathology about people's reactions to those colours, but let's just keep it simple. We need to focus on determinative facts, okay? So not all, there are facts, but not all facts are equal. Certain facts actually have significant. They determine situations, they determine outcomes, and in fact are absolutely critical to um, um, a situation and how it transpires, okay? Determinative facts, separate them out. We need to get rid of purge, I love that strong word, purge analysis of hidden and unsupportable assumptions. Right. And this is really important because if you're going back and reviewing, and I think one of the readings I put up talked about a case in England where, you know, the, the local authority was making decisions on unsupported and unverified information. Stuff that they'd got out of previous case files that hadn't been checked. In fact, frankly, it was inaccurate, right? And it was all to support the narrative of the dangerous mother. We need to look at that um, and, and check. Go, and sometimes, you know, like if it's a, a significant case in, and, you know, you've got the issues about time allocated to something, to go back and check for verifiability and that these assumptions are supported and to, uh, to absolutely... Uh, expose, you know, that's the biggest ethical responsibility, expose unsupported assumptions, show those assumptions to be, which um, can be sometimes blatant moral panics and blatant prejudice or hostility to um, different kinds of parenting and family situations, you know, based on different notions of class, particular kind of hegemonic understandings of gender, etc. Okay, I love this. I love this. I love this. When you so we talked about this kind of grammat, gr grammatical components, and and how, and we do this all the time, and how simple phrases can be misled and have a life of their own. Oh my goodness, and can be quoted out of context. And you know what? These kind of phrases, which impute sort of morality of, of behaviour, have been used to jail people, have been used to take children away. Again, without looking at the facts. They really do have a life of their own. And this is a word that you may be unfamiliar with. It's called passing. Okay, now this is a methodology and I think it's the greatest gift that legal writing can give to social work. Passing. To use this method to reduce misreading a situation. Passing. It's the process of breaking down sentences into their grammatical components for the purpose of analysing them. So it involves deep and close reading. Let's have a look at this rather novel case I came across and I've just taken some photo shots of the case to go through it because it's just, it's good, it's simple. So this is a, um, a, a case study and it's, it's called the first year students are revolting. Now that's what was overheard. So let's go through the scenario. Soraya and Robert are first year law students could be social work students, and have been getting to know the layout of the law library. So they're in the library one day while they were looking at a hard, hard copy bound volumes in the law journal section. By the way, all those things would be factual irrelevancies if we were, if this was a different case study. They overheard part of a conversation between one of their lecturers and one of the tutors. So they're eavesdropping. 
They heard the lecturer say the following before the two academics moved out of earshot. So they started a conversation, but you didn't get to hear the end of it. What did the lecturer say to the tutor? <laughs> Make a great film. The first year students are revolting. Soraya and Robert didn't hear the tutor's response. They only have the first sentence to work with in order to attempt to understand what the hell these two academics were discussing. This is not an unusual scenario. Soraya and Robert are not sure what to make of the comment. Fair enough. Should they feel offended on behalf of their classmates or concerned about something that is causing their classmates to protest or should they feel relieved to know that their teachers feel sympathetic about how they are feeling as first year law students. So there's a range of possible meanings, hermeneutics, Hermeneutics means interpretations, but there's also an emotional feel to each of these. So these are fairly loaded perspectives, yeah? This sentence seems straightforward, but is in its simplicity is deceptive. And this is why this is a great case study. This sentence could have been part of a conversation relating to at, at, um, at least, a bit of typo there, at least three different contexts, okay? They've identified three, you probably could even find more. Passing the sentence, that is to say, breaking the sentence down into its grammatical components can help us understand why these five simple words, the first years are revolting, have three, at least, at least three different meanings. So we're gonna look at the three. Okay, context one, we're gonna call each of these scenarios a context. So let's look context one. The two academics might have been referring to the difficulties that just about every law student experiences adjusting to life at law school, especially in first year. The full conversation could have been something like this. So here we go. The lecturer. The first year students are revolting. Tutor. Sure, they sure are. Law school gets a lot better and much easier by third year. So the key point to note with the lecturer's statement here is that the word revolting is used as an adjective, okay, descriptive, to describe the noun years, which itself is described by another adjective, first. Thus, it is the first years, as opposed to the later years, that have a quality that is repugnant or disgusting. Okay, you will want to go back and review these. Make sure you take in this first context. I'm not going to do that now, but you pause and have a think about what's being said. So press the pause now on the YouTube. Just wait a few minutes, reread it. Let's look at the second context. Alternatively, the two academics might have been referring to the way in which the students were responding to the fact that their first assignments had just been marked and returned. So we didn't know that context, did we? The full conversation could have been something like this. So context is bloody important. The first years are revolting. They sure are. They're not happy with the marks that they received for their assignment. Here the word revolting is a verb. Verbs are words that indicate the existence of a state of being or that an action is being performed or carried out. Just remember that, grammar 101. In this example, the word revolting is the present participle of the verb that in its infinitive form is expressed to revolt. Now, just in case I've lost you, don't worry. I don't know all the technicalities of grammar. Those of you who do, fantastic. Together, these words are referred to as a compound verb and convey the meaning that this student, that this student rebellion is ongoing. Okay, so let's have a look at the explanation. The words first year function no longer as an adjective and noun as I did in the first example. If that were the case, the years qualified by the adjective first would be the things that doing, would be the things that doing the revolting that are doing the revolting. That's not logical, doesn't make sense. Instead, the words first years act as a compound noun in this sentence, standing in place of the words first year students. 
again, I would recommend that you put pause the video now, go back and read what has been said here in terms of an alternative explanation and then the analysis. Let's move on to the third context now. In a further alternative, the academics have been referring to the state of dress and personal hygiene of certain first year students. I love this one. This is a real different spin on it. The full conversation might have been similar to this. The lecturer. The first years are revolting. Tutor. They sure are. Yesterday, many of them came to, to my class after playing touch football in the rain. They obviously didn't have time to take a shower. In this third example, then, the words first years in the lecturer's sentence act as a compound noun, referring to first year students. They are being described by the word revolting. As, this, as in the first context, the word revolting, again, is used as an adjective, it's describing things. But here, it qualifies a compound noun, indicating the first years are disgusting or repugnant. Okay, so knowing some of the grammar, some of the grammatical labels and the context, folks, helps us understand that different things could be going on, how we interpret the situation and that grammar actually matters. So even, so we just talked about grammar, even how we frame a question can automatically lead us down one particular path or we can go down another path, yeah? So can client A be convicted under section yada 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 of the legislation? Is client A guilty of an offence? Very different emphasis. Can client A be convicted for, convicted for the offence? Or are there other remedies? Okay, you need to examine the impact on family, the person you're working with, legal costs, likelihood of conviction. So it's different ways of framing the question. So we're going to go through some of this, and this is all going to help you with some of the kind of report writing, academic writing, um, umbrella paragraph or section to summarise a legal, legal rule for each issue, any other information about the rule, burden of proof or assumptions. Not all this is necessarily necessary. As I said, this is more for law students, but there are some areas where we all, you will see that are relevant for social work practice. And in fact, I will be uploading a, um, a sample um, exercise for you to go to, through in your tutorial groups um, next week. Identify elements not in dispute, and why, and in a roadmap, we'll have a look at those. It'll make, this is a bit vague, it'll make more sense when we go through it. So what the hell is crack? It's not a drug. Okay, so it's a method of argumentation of report writing. State your conclusion, one sentence. One sentence prediction about how a court would rule on the factor you're discussing or indeed what intervention, what recommendations are you making for the family or the case work um, situation. Okay, so when it says court, always think about it. you might be a case conference, it might be a hearing system, um, it might be some kind of recommendation. State the governing rule of law. So this comes back to your authorities. Which legislation? Apply the rule. So you've got to identify which legislation and the section and what it enables you to do. And then you have to say, well, this is why this legislation is relevant for this strategy or this intervention. And it could, it could be, uh, depending on what your strategies and your interventions are, you could actually be showcasing a range of laws and statutes, depending on what you want to happen, right? What you're arguing for. Not just what, what, you, have, what you want to have, have, have happen, but what you're arguing for. This is, you know, so apply the rule to your facts using analogies, sometimes counter analogies, and then state your conclusion, right? So how not to do it? Again, just putting this in, just to state the obvious. There are many considerations that bear on the possibility of a conviction or, or a particular intervention that you want to have if it's not in the context of criminal law. But the most important thing is without the proper mens rea, that's identifying the particular state of mind of the person accused of a crime, you can't be convicted, right? You don't just get all legal for the sake of it. That slide predominantly relates to when working with offenders accused persons. 
Okay, here we got the issue of stylistic, and again, this comes back to the issue about different writing for different purposes. So topic versus thesis sentences. Okay, topic sentences are fav often favoured by teachers of composition. Um, actually, your part B, um, when you're looking at the case study, is more uh, essay is, is more of a, a topic. We're getting you to consider a whole bunch of issues. It's good for writing essays. You don't, it's not from legal memos. So I think the important thing here is that part A of your EAL assessment case study, um, assessment one is, is in fact a report. It's not an essay, right? It, it's a memo. It's a report. Thesis, the thesis sentence prepares the reader for the remainder of the paragraph and avoids giving away the argument, right? Usually you're running the people through and then you kind of come to you, you know, when you're writing an essay, a grand conclusion. You want to showcase, and recite and repeat your theories. But this is a bad idea in legal writing. Let me show you why. Actually, no, we've got a little bit more. I forgot I put this one up. So again, thesis sentences, thesis sentences disfavoured by teachers of composition, but loved by teachers of legal writing. Remember the lesson, keep it boring, right? Concise, concise, concise. Begin the paragraph by explaining as concisely and directly as possible the concepts to be discussed and the conclusions they point to. So here's an example of a topic versus thesis sentence. I'm just using a case here. You know, Wapner versus Denton, it's a case you don't need to, you don't need to know what was in the case, but dealt with when a choice is sufficiently voluntary to constitute the assumption of risk. Okay. So it's about kind of foreseeable risk. A different way of talking about the same issue is to use this thesis sentence, a choice is not voluntary if the person is forced to choose between the threatened harm and another equal or greater harm. Okay, already for you guys coming in not knowing anything about this case and not necessarily even looking at issues around duty of care or negligence, you've got a sense from the thesis section what the hell this sentence is about and what it's pointing out. So here's another example topic sentence which we're trying to avoid. In evaluating liability for fraud, courts have considered a wide range of factors, including materiality. Right, thank you, gotcha. Thesis sentence, an accused cannot be convicted for fraud if her alleged false representations were not material to the transaction. That's a little bit clearer. Again, it might not be so clear for you because there's particular kind of inferences um, which assume a certain legal background. What if you need more information? Better to own up to it. Don't hide it, it'll be, it'll be discovered. You need more information or there are debates and disagreements about an issue, put it in. It's always appropriate when writing a memo to devote space to factual questions that need to be ascertained, right? There's certain facts that we need to find out. You know, whether client A in fact did use heroin or used to drink alcohol. These are significant differences. One of my students on a previous placement at one stage discovered that the local authority just kept regurgitating, kept recycling the fact that the client A was a heroin addict. In fact, they'd never used heroin in their life. So we kind of need to, um, you know, we, we kind of need to go to the facts and and, and um, check them out. And normally when writing, um, you know, a memo uh, for a supervisor, uh, we, it's important to return to the factual questions that you know need to be answered because your supervisor may, may know or be able to get those extra details or, or in fact may, and may have simply in fact failed to realise that they were significant. There's some areas where depending on the facts, the whole issue could be turned and in different in, interventions, it could be reinterpreted, um, different kinds of sense of what their risk issues are um, and you need to kind of go and follow up those facts or, and, and point out whether they've been overlooked. So here we go again, structuring the discussion section, issues with several elements. 
Um, here we are discussing burglary and assault. Actually, it's meant to be domestic violence, but I hadn't updated the slides. That's what happens when you don't update your own slides. But okay, so again, so we're looking at domestic abuse, domestic violence. Client A cannot be charged with domestic abuse where domestic abuse uh, fits in. Not sure what happened there. Um, so, client A so can't be charged. Um, you need to look at the elements of domestic abuse, and maybe in fact that the circumstances actually doesn't. Um, uh, it's not covered under that legislation. Um, so, there might be an alternatively, client A can be charged with domestic abuse under sections blah 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 because they meet um, in one of the areas or all the areas the elements of domestic abuse. Again, we need to look at the fact that the objective versus persuasive writing. Always remember the audience. In objective writing, such as a memo, we we do have to assess the landscape or the life world, you know, um, and to look at what would a reasonable person. What what do we talk about in terms of reasonable parenting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what would they do um, to include and include all the relevant objects that complicate the landscape. Um, who is the reasonable person assumed to be in the setting that you're working with? And this is not the opportunity again to kind of write a long drawn out essay. Uh, this is about who, what assumptions are we making about um, a good parent in law? There's nothing wrong with advancing a particular position in a memo, but you need to, I think the important bit about this is you need to give due regard to all sides. What could be the counter argument to what you're presenting? So you're not helping um, your supervisor, or in fact the client, if you ignore the counter arguments. In persuasive writing, particularly looking at facts, we describe the landscape as we want others to see it. So here's the persuasive aspect, focusing on key objects that support this perspective. Who's the audience? Is it the court? Is it a children's hearing? Is it an interprofessional case conference? You need to tailor your tone and language accordingly. Your goal is to get the court, the forum or the body to adopt your position. Again, we need to look at analogies and distinctions, remembering that the audience, remember who the audience is, what's your reader looking for? Uh, not all, you need to watch this as comes up, certainly as somebody who's newly migrated to Scotland, I've become very, very aware of this. Not all analogies travel across different social worlds, different disciplines, language, or in fact are culturally understood. So if you get that wrong, an analogy can totally backfire. Watch out using in-house social work or legal jargon of certain phrases, particularly acronyms. So you need to revise the goals. Of, so what are the goals of revision? Clarify your facts, check, 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 check. Uh, clarify your argument. Well, how are you going to link these facts together? Check your sentences out and make sure that you can reference um, your decision making to a legal authority. And that's able to be understood. Again, getting back to this issue of facts, not to leave implicit any details that need to be explained. And we talked about this issue about highlighting. It goes on the facts. You all need to work out what the determinative facts, determinative facts are, what are the paramount facts versus from just like facts that really aren't that important. Okay, so you need to explain any details. Don't burden the reader. Just don't go on and on and on with unnecessary details. So for example, you know, you might get a case study or situation where something is thrown in, in some ways to throw you off guard. It's, 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 it, it may be true, the fact, but how is it relevant? Is it relevant or is it, is it extraneous? You know, again, get that little critical antennae up. 
review for any important relevant facts that are missing. So this is really critical. Don't just go on what a report says or what you've been presented. Are there omissions? The sin of omission. What is not said? Because actually sometimes, um, you know, whether it be through some sense of conscious choice or um, sloppy professional practice, omission of facts, what has not been said? Where are the silences? You know, who hasn't been consulted? Make sure you don't leave out relevant facts just because you don't like them. Okay, and we did that with the core case theory. You can't just rearrange facts, particularly facts that might be unpleasant or disturbing or go against your particular recommendation. Okay, and to create short forms for names of parties and statutes. Again, just moving through here, we're moving very quickly. Some of this is obvious to clarify your argument. You need to show with the order of your argument, does it make sense? Is, it, is there, you should reflect about, you know, in a deliberative way, a choice about how you present them. Don't just bung them in. Again, go back and look at the slide on the different ways of presenting narrative in that memo. Front load most of your ideas and arguments, put the secondary ones in later. Any miscellaneous bits, put them in the footnotes. Okay. Again, keep in mind your basic theories. Why is it so? How are you explaining what's gone on and the result you want to seek? So if, for example, there's been some kind of traumatic experience within the family in relation to parents and children, how do you explain this? What are the possibilities? What are the options? What has the person done to reduce the possibility of something happening again? Okay. And again, one way to check for effective use of topic sense is to read only the topic sentence for each paragraph. And that gives you the sense of kind of, what's your argument? What am I trying to say here in each paragraph? Each paragraph should kind of form the basis of kind of like a little mini argument. And use numerals. You know, sometimes it's like, you'll find often in reports, they will number each paragraph. That's so you can trace it and you can find it. Okay, so I've just put, I'm not gonna talk about this sentence here, but things like there are particular words that you might need to look at and they are words that um, um, are, are, are verbs and they um, uh, express emotion. And again, you can keep looking at this, streamlining the sentences, pause that and move through, not going through these streamlining sentences. Um, I think the important bit about this, um, and I will uh, upload a scenario for you to look at of a, a random event and getting a sense of you going through this exercise. It's And it can be a bit frightening initially, um, uh, but getting a sense of how you pull out the determinative facts from the minor facts, how you get rid of the clutter, how you describe the facts, and then also then what are the issues that arise out of facts? Okay, some, in some reports, sometimes people will actually present the issues first and then the facts section, second, and then thirdly, what you want to happen. What conclusion are you? Uh, because this is a persuasive piece. You're arguing for recommendations and outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. I will see you in class.